we still have a few minutes, but y'all got quiet. So, I mean, unless you just want to stare at me the whole time, I guess I'll talk. Um, take care of some business anyways, uh, since we do have a little bit of a shortened class down to 40 minutes now instead of the 45 that we're used to. I uh, want to welcome everyone here this morning, especially those that are joining us um, via the live stream. Hope that you're able to participate. Please uh, be as active as you can from there, and I will do my best to try to share what we say in here. Since it's difficult to hear uh, the, the audience, I'll try to share what is said uh, to keep you uh, involved in the class. I do want to uh, welcome and, and thank all of our mothers this morning. Say happy Mother's Day to all of you. Um, hopefully, this is an uh, enjoyable day, but I know it's also, for, for many with various reasons, uh, can be filled with all different types of emotions. So we're thankful for our mothers and for what they mean for the kingdom of God and for this world. And if you are one of those, no doubt you are a hard worker. I don't care what anybody says, because I've seen it firsthand. They would die after the first week if us men had to uh, take care of them. So never once take that for granted at all. Um, the other thing that I wanted to take a little bit of time to do is that uh, just to, to thank you all for, for this class. This is the last class. For those who are visiting, we've been studying the, the book of, or the Gospel of John, and we are concluding that today. Um, so this is our last class for this trimester. But I've really enjoyed it. Um, I've enjoyed teaching with Sterling and Kevin. Um, I've told everybody I've been intimidated because I, I hold those, both, those two guys in high regard. But I've enjoyed uh, teaching with them, and I've enjoyed this class. And I've really enjoyed the fact that all of you are willing to speak up in such a big uh, room like this and, and give me feedback. That's, what, that's how I teach, and, and you all have been receptive to that. So I appreciate it, and I hope it's, it's been a benefit to you as well. All right, well, we're at our time, a little bit past it, so we'll go ahead and get started this morning, and as we uh, typically do, we'll, we'll get started um, with a prayer. Dear God and Father, we come before you this morning so thankful for the opportunity that we have on your day to come and to remember your son's sacrifice for us and to be able to approach your throne because of his willingness to come to this earth and to live to share uh, from, your wor or from your words to this world and to ultimately be a sacrifice for us. We thank you for that. We're also mindful this morning, Father, of our mothers and for what they mean to all of us. And we thank you for them and ask that you will continue to bless them, bless the children that they raise in this world and for the importance that they are uh, to you and to your kingdom and to this world. And we thank you for that. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. All right. So does anybody remember what your homework assignment was? Yep, crickets. Crickets. Y'all didn't listen very well. Well, here, maybe this will uh, we'll get the creative juices or at least the, the juices flowing of what I asked you to do. So I asked you to go and to think about sections of John that maybe you had questions about, maybe you had... Um, thoughts about that you wanted to share. And so hopefully some of you did that. If not, that's okay. We'll figure it out. But what I've put up here is a word cloud. And if you don't know what a word cloud is, it's basically where they can take a book or something else, any sort of literature or anything like that, and they can take all the words, and when I say all the words, not a and the and 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 those type of words, but substantial words, and based off of how many times they're used is how big they are in this word cloud. So you can see, based off of this, Jesus and Father are pretty much the, the main two words used in the Gospel of John. But there's other words that are used. There's no and world and disciples and one and life and believe and then the Jews and even Peter over there on the left side uh, puts his name gets his name in there quite a bit so word cloud words that come out of the book I know some of you did your homework what do you have what from John would you like to share with us yes sir you always count on Bobby to share with me <laughs> okay uh-oh, you put me on the spot already. <laughs> okay, I got you. What's up? You know, Jesus, probably the thing that he got asked the most is, why did you say that you were the son of God when Joseph and Mary is your father? 
Okay. Okay. Why he never does? Well, I, Jesus wasn't conceived as the Son of God, as he's always been. He was at the beginning, and he's, he's the Word that is God. And so I don't think that, I think there was a relational aspect to that, and that's what we're giving, but I don't think that there's any sort of conception that uh, comes from that. And so that's why there's no description there. Now, as far as him coming into this world, he came from the Father, and I think he shows that very clearly. So is that... Is that the answer you're looking for, or is that, do you have your own answer? Okay. I wanted you to, to, to explain to the people how that God's plan was, how he was going to come. He's not, Joseph is not his father. Okay, well, yeah. Yeah. So you're wanting him to explain his conception into this world and how he came from the father. Yeah, well, I understand that. And he never does that, to your point, but he does make it abundantly clear throughout the book of John who his father is and that his father is not Joseph of this world, that that is his earthly father, but yet his father is, um, you know, God himself. And he talks about that quite a bit in John. So do you think, you think if he clarified that he was from God through the, the description of how he was conceived on this earth, that they would just automatically believe? Okay, I got you. Well, maybe. I doubt that, though. I thought I saw a hand somewhere else. Yes, ma'am. What did he say? Shame on me. I thought I, I gave you that. I gave you all my side of the, the conversation here. Bobby said basically that what, he's, what he wrestles with is the fact that they ask him or he tells them who his father is and they say, you can't do these things because we know who your father is. Your father's Joseph and his father was, was God. And so Bobby said, why does he never explain how he truly came from heaven the way that we would want him to explain that to basically clear that up for them? And he never does that. Um, and I... My reasoning behind that is exactly how I think there's a lot of scripture that talks about the fact that we're given so many things that we would still not believe um, if we were shown those. And so I think that's ultimately the answer. But very good question and thought. Yes, ma'am, Miss Mary, and then behind you. Okay. Okay. Maybe so. Mary being a virgin that Miss Mary thinks that, you know, maybe that's a way to attack her and he wasn't going to allow that to happen. That's a good point. No, go ahead. If you've got your homework, let's, let's go right here. Yes, ma'am. Gotcha.
Yep. Good point. Ms. Mary references John chapter 7 verse 39 and just talks about the fact that there are so many different things for Jesus um, in his in his titles and clearly who he is and that's something that we're going to touch on a little bit this morning and all of those things were only sometimes seen by the perception of that one individual or that one group of people until he was actually glorified and shown to be all of those things to where we can actually see all of those things brought together. Uh, and I think that that's a, a very good point. Yes, ma'am. Good point. Good point. Yeah, I think he shows that a lot. It, it's difficult for them to separate the flesh from the spirit, or at least to put their spiritual glasses on. And he had that conversation with Nicodemus, and and he almost, I don't think Nicodemus seriously meant this question, but do you mean I need to be, you know, go back into my mother's womb and be born again? I mean, it's almost sarcastic to where that they couldn't understand it. And so uh, I agree with you. I think Jesus clearly in so many different ways tried to in this book to show the spiritual nature of what he had come to do and who God was and everybody, including the Pharisees and all those who were the religious elite, wanted to approach God in a physical way and they couldn't get past those two things. I think that's a great point. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. That he was more special to Jesus than, than the rest of them. So just saying that he's the, the disciple that Jesus loved is not holding it over their heads? Well, <laughs> it's descriptive? Yeah. yeah. I, just don't, I don't read that he had any... Um, it's the description of himself. Yeah, and he didn't seem to have any real um, feeling of superiority. Gotcha. Paula talks about the humility of John, even though that he was, you know, in many ways uh, said as the the disciple that Jesus loved. I think that's important. All right. Any other thoughts? There's a lot of y'all didn't do your homework. You dog ate it. Jimmy, your dog ate it, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, very good point. And the the quick way of, of what uh, Floyd was saying was just that we come to a belief of who Jesus is on our own and um, through the words that we read. And I think that that is a good kind of segue into really what I want to talk about. In fact, if you remember, Sterling, I, I think a third of the New Testament belief, the word belief is in John. Is that what I remember seeing in some of my notes? So, that's a big push of what John is trying to do. In fact, what is our memory verse that we've been talking about? I'm going to, you know, remind us of that, but it's for us to believe. And that's what John does here. And I think there's a uniqueness to that that we're going to get to of how John approaches to help us um, believe versus the other uh, disciples. So, or the other gospels. All right. Um, (laughs) 
the, so I was trying to think about how, how do you go back and conclude a, a book that we've literally, you know, exhaustively tried to study over the last couple of, of uh, months. And one of the things that I thought of is, is a good presentation. I think this is a quote from somebody I never could find who it was. But you tell them what you're going to say in a presentation. You tell them what you're going to say. You say it and then you tell them what you've said. Well, we're at the point where we're telling you what we've said. All right. So this is... This is the rehash of the, 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 a good trimester, hopefully, is that we're going to tell you what we've said. And that's where I wanted you to be able to bring out things that you recall from this. Because ultimately, that's uh, what a class is about, is most of us probably in our lives, if we've been uh, in the church for a long time, have read the book of John multiple times. But I think any time you can go back through it afresh, excuse me, you can go back through it afresh, it will bring out something new to you. And hopefully we were able to do that. So just real quick about it, as we've already talked, the author is John. Uh, the reason that we know that is because of some of the things he says, as well as being the son of Zebedee and not mentioning his name in a lot of the stories, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And then real quickly, what was the purpose? Well, we have our memory verse, and I do want to read that just because I think it's important for us to read that one more time together as a group uh, to remind us of what that is. So turn to John chapter 20. Verses 30 through 31, John says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in his name. All right, so one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit is the uniqueness of this gospel. I saw some chart somewhere that this gospel only shares about 9% of similarity with the other Gospels. I don't know how accurate that is, and I, I think we all realize that the Gospel of John is different. But how, how is it different? What is John's approach that maybe some of the other Gospels don't take? In many ways, it seems like he writes this one assuming perhaps you may already have read the other three. Okay. Okay, in some ways he writes it to, uh, in a way that assumes you've already had background in the other three. I think there's potential there. It's not chronological, okay. It's not chronological in a lot of ways. Some of it tries to uh, hold chron uh, chronologically, but not all of it. You're correct. What else about it is unique? Obviously, it's not a typical biography as the others are. They start with the birth, yep. essentially, and go to his death. This one just deals with, uh, what, about the last week of his life? Primarily, absolutely. I think in, um, is it chapter 13 where it turns tonight? We're going to talk about that. But that, that's that last week, essentially. So yeah, the, the other uh, 13, 12 to 13 chapters only deal with parts of his life. And then the last is, is dealt with in the end. So yeah, absolutely. What else about it? And it's kind of in the prologue here, which I'll just put up there. But what does he... There's a, there's a phrase that I'm looking for that John does versus some of the other Gospels. What do the other Gospels really focus on, it seems like? I think John, his focus is who Jesus is, not necessarily what Jesus does. And I think that that starts really at the beginning of his book because what is it? In the beginning was the word. Who? You know, who is this? And then at the very end, he takes us to follow me. So there's, there's these, there's these um, bookends of who it is and what you're supposed to do with that person is to follow them. And, and that's how he kind of bridges that. So the whole time, he's not really telling us Jesus did this miracle or Jesus gave us this parable, but rather this is who Jesus is, all the I am statements and things that we see in there. So I think that's unique um, to this. I know that um, we've read it multiple times, but here again, this is the last real major section that I want to read together as a group. But I want to go back and I want to read that prologue. Having gone through and read all through John, understanding what, John, or what Jesus has done with his disciples and all the things that he's um, been a part of, and then ultimately to his death, his resurrection, and, and then to where he meets with his disciples one last time right there when they're fishing, and talks to them about that. Now, now go back to what John tries to begin our thoughts with about who Jesus is. So we're just going to read 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was the beginning with God. 
All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, all, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name... He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen this glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace." For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. So, you really see the full picture of what John tries to begin with when you go through the the book. He begins with the Word. Why Why are we describing Jesus as the Word? Think about what happens in John. Why would Jesus be described as the Word? That's right. He brought the words from the Father. That they were what was brought to Him. And then ultimately when Jesus leaves, the Holy Spirit will bring words that are from the Father through Jesus, right? So Jesus is the Word that was with God from the beginning and then is brought here in John. What else? Why else would he be called the Word? Does he read? God speaks to the world. Okay. And Jesus, not only in what he said, but as your point was made a while ago, in who he was and who he is, God speaks to the world. Now, we borrow from Hebrews 1 and the first couple of verses there. Jesus, uh, God spoke in time past by the prophets. He speaks to us now through his son, but that's not merely what the son said. It's also who the son was and what the son did. That's why he said, I have this testimony from the father. And uh, he's speaking, among other things, of his miracles that he did. Yeah, great point. Jesus is the message of God. Yeah, very good point. Ultimately, where Jim was going is, is that he said Jesus is the message of God. And for those who weren't able to hear that, I think the main point is not just, we don't just worry about what Jesus said, but actually his life and the things that he did are all part of that word and the message. Exactly right. Uh, it reveals stuff to us. I think that's something Sterling brought out in the beginning when he did the, the introduction to this, to this book. It reveals Words reveal, they got Jesus as the Word has revealed God's plan, has revealed God's will for us, all of those things, so they do reveal. Um, it talks about him being with God, but he also was God, separate but the same, right? That there's, uh, the way that I kind of put this in here and I, I pulled it out from, I'm plagiarizing a lot of what Sterling said the first couple of classes, but Three beings, or three persons, one being, right? There's, there's that separation, but yet there's that unity, and that's what's brought out here, is that he's uh, with God and was God. Uh, turn over to John 5, 26. John brings this out as well when he talks about it in the prologue that life was in him. But if you notice in 5 and verse 26, he says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. In himself, so in him is life. Uh, it talks about that in the prologue, and then it talks about him being the source of light. And we mention light. What was when Jesus says, "I am the light," and we're going to talk about the "I am" statements here just briefly. But when Jesus says that, what is what did we talk about that he means by that? What does light do? It reveals, right? 
dispels darkness. In fact, it talks about the fact that light and life are both greater than darkness. Absolutely. What else? D- show you the way to where you need to go. Okay. He is also the way. Light shows you the way. He is the way. Dispelling darkness is essentially shining light on things that have darkness. So, yeah. When does he, just a side note, when does he talk about being the light? Do y'all remember? Where does, where does he say, I am the light? I think it's next on my slides. We'll see. No, we'll come back to this. When does he talk about being the light? John 8. Where, do y'all remember what was going on then? Not the blind man. Yeah. And right, but right after, right after what? What, ha- what happens right before he says, I am the light? Yes, and it was the Feast of Tabernacles, and he talks about that light up on the hill and all that, and that's, that's ultimately where he's going to. But one of the things that I, and maybe I'm, I'm following my own path here, and I'll just go ahead and tell you what my, my crazy brain, brain is thinking. But this is where they brought to him the adulterous woman, right, called in adultery. And then right after that, now, granted, we don't know if it's immediately after whatever, but he talks about the fi- fact that he's the light. And what was going on in order to bring her to them and all that. It talks about multiple witnesses and all these different things, right? When you have the light, you don't have any dark places to see. There's no dark there that that hides any of those things that you need multiple uh, perceptions in different directions to look at this. You have true light given to be able to judge and to understand. And I think that's a little bit, I guess, to me, what I felt like Jesus is also getting to is he has the example of this feast and he has the opportunity to talk about the light that's lighting up but he also does it on the heels of men bringing an adulterous woman to him to condemn her in front of uh, him and talk about that Um, so I, I just you know something that I thought about all right so let's go did somebody say something yes Yeah. So you ought to be able to take he, going back to what you said, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna say. Yeah. I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna tell you what I just said. John does the exact same approach. So you should as we look back on the weeks that we spent, you should be able to see how John made the case that he established those first eighteen verses. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, he begins that with that prologue and what Sterling basically said is you can almost go through and read that and as you dissect that out, you can look and find places where John then solidifies that or brings that to light, uh, no pun intended, as you go through uh, the rest of the, the book. So I think that's exactly right. So just a little bit more about light, light versus darkness. Uh, Sterling brought up the fact that basically right here at 13 in chapter 30, that John makes a clear Um, distinction between the light that we've been in and the darkness that comes. If you go real quick to 13 and and verse 30, he says, so after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. And this was basically where Judas leaves the feast that they're having together. And when he goes out, it is now night. And one thing that I think this he alludes to it earlier, but I think my mind immediately went to John chapter 3 and verse 19, where he talks about the fact when um, Jesus is speaking, he says, uh, where am I at? Sorry, I was in chapter 4. It says, uh, and this is the judgment, the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So, what actually happens here after the transition? What happens in these next 13 verses, or next, um, it's not, it's eight chapters. What happens in the next eight chapters? Y'all know it. I want you to say it. What happens? Yeah. 
Okay. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. All right. Yeah, I agree with you. When he says that he's the light, he's showing that he is with the Father, and he's the source of light, right? When, when God says, let there be light at the beginning, Jesus was in the beginning with him, and John has established that. But after John chapter 13 and verse 30, and night happens, and darkness is across, at, at, from the night, darkness is there, what happens throughout the rest of the book? Yep. Exactly. The only light to be seen or to be talked about is in the upper room until he comes out of the tomb and then light appears again. And I don't, I, that doesn't mean that day and night didn't occur through all of these things. But what it does mean is that where the, the Friday night where this is occurring, going into the, the crucifixion, there is, no, there is no light. There's no sunshine. There's no none of those things up until when he's put on the cross and then the entire uh, earth at that time, or at least that area, is darkened uh, from that, and that darkness is over the whole face of the earth. So I think it's something that John does to remind us of the darkness that's coming. And then when he talks about Jesus as the light and he talks about things that we like when we say mankind, that we as humans like in the darkness to be able to hide our evils and our sins, he shows that distinctly in this book. Um, very prominent about light versus darkness. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, so just real quick, what are the seven? There were seven miracles. There were seven uh, names given for Jesus, and then there's seven I am statements. We're going to talk about the miracles and I am's. Water to wine. Think about some of these things. Because I think it's important to understand, one, a, the, a little bit of the progression of the miracles, but two, the different things that the miracles show that Jesus has power over. So water to wine, and then you have the healing of the nobleman's son, so power over the body and over sickness, healing of the man with infirmity for 38 years, feeding of the 5,000. What's unique about feeding of the 5,000 in John? Do I remember? As compared to the other Gospels. This is the only miracle that is found in all four Gospels, if I'm not mistaken on that. And I don't think that I am. So this, when we talk about the fact that John doesn't have a lot of the same stuff and everything, this is the only one that's found in all four Gospels. Um, so he feeds the 5,000, walks on water, healing of the blind man, and then ultimately to the resurrection of Lazarus. Uh, those, seven, those seven miracles. All right, so the seven I am statements. Now, where do these I am statements come? Where does the bread of life come? Just talked about it. Where does he say this? After the feeding of the 5,000, right? Because they're actually, they come back to him looking for a Moses, right? Moses fed us the manna in the wilderness, and they're looking for that. And he says, I'm the bread of life, is essentially what he's saying to them. That, you know, I am the bread of life that you're looking for. The light of the world, we talked about the adulterous woman as well as the fact that this was during the, the Feast of Booze. The, the door, what does he talk about in regards to the door and the good shepherd? What's he speaking of there? What's, in, what's the significance of a door? Keeps out and keeps in, exactly, right? Keeps out and keeps in. And it talks about the sheep door, right? He's actually protecting the sheep here. So it's not just about him being the good shepherd, which encompasses all of that, but he's actually the door that will protect, that is closed behind, but also opens to let in, right? Does both of those things. And then he talks about the good shepherd. And how is, how is Jesus as a shepherd important to us? How can we pull from that? What's important about him saying that? I'm not a shepherd. I don't know much about it. But what do we know about sheep and a shepherd? Okay, he knows the sheep. They know him by his voice, right? What about sheep that, what'd you say? Okay, God protects, feeds them, right? Leads them to sustenance such as still waters and leads them through green pastures and all those things. And Jesus not only says, I am the shepherd, but I am the good shepherd that does those. Just what? I lay my, down my life for my sheep, right? Uh, it's perhaps significant that shepherds lead and do not drive. 
Very good point. Yeah, that's, I like that. Hadn't thought about that. Shepherds lead and do not drive like you drive cattle, but yet shepherds lead. Um, and I appreciate you saying that. Well, and he's also not a hired hand. That's right. Talks about that. Very good point. So the resurrection and the life, he talks about that around the time that he uh, raises Lazarus. And then the way, the truth, and the life, and the true vine is the upper room teachings. I think these are significant. The only reason that I want to bring these out just really quick is the fact that these are with his disciples alone. Thomas says, we want to go with you. Where are you going? And he says, I am the way. You know, we, or he says, how do we know where you're going? Urgh. I had that in my mind. Sorry. Uh, 14, verse 6, just so I can make sure that, yeah. So Thomas said to him, Lord, do we, yeah, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And that's when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, and no one gets to the Father except through me. And he talks about that to them. And then the true vine. Why is that important? Well, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it. But the true vine with the disciples, I think, is obviously true for all Christians. But I think it's important that it was taught to them and shared with them during these teachings because what was coming for them was going to be mass persecution and grafting themselves and and getting themselves to the vine to then produce fruit was so important with what was coming because A, they needed a stable foundation. They need something that they were secure to, but B, they needed to bear fruit. The spreading of the gospel did not come through lazy disciples or through quiet disciples. It had to come through bearing of their fruit and true, um, you know, focus on that. All right, so real quick, because I'm, I'm running a little bit out of time and I want to finish up with a few things. The upper room teaching towards the end of the book, he washes the disciples' feet. He's very humble at that. I am statements and teaching. And then finally, the prayer. Anything unique about the prayer with John? Again, these are just weird facts, but I'm trying to stick them in your head. Anything? He prayed for us. Okay, he prayed for us. Absolutely. That's great. He prayed for us. What else? There's a couple things about it. It's the longest prayer that we have of Jesus, right? It's the long, we, we have other prayers, but that's the longest prayer, and he does. He prays for us. He prays for all mankind, and then ultimately so that what, what can happen? What, there's something that's talked about a lot towards the end of his prayer. Glorified, right? He's going to be glorified. The Father's going to be glorified. All of these things are going to happen in order to give glory to the Father. So I think that's important. All right. Uh, we have the, um, before the high priest, before Pilate, Peter's denial. I do think that the, the Mother's Day scene, I just put that in there for, this, for today. Uh, he did make sure that his mother was taken care of. Who was standing next to his mother? Well, the disciple that he loves, right, which is John. But yes, the disciple that he loves is who. Um, and then what does John say about her time with him after that? Does anybody remember? He would take her just like his own. Okay, take her as his own. But what does it say? There's a time frame of that. Do you remember? Huh? Yeah, but I mean, how long did he, did he keep her? Is the reason that I wanted to bring that out. Yeah, exactly. That she stayed with him. Um, I was hoping to find that pretty quick. I can, I think. Um, yeah, but woman, behold your son. And then he said this to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple, the disciple took her to his own home. So basically from then on, she was with, with John. I think that's important to note. Last few things, he appears to Mary Magdalene. He appears to disciples multiple times. What, what new unique thing happens during his first appearing? Does anybody remember? Well, yeah, so Thomas wasn't there. You're right. They don't recognize him. In verse 22, it says that when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So I know we, we see them receive the Holy Spirit later on in Acts, but I think that this is a significant event 
from a resurrected Jesus who's leaving them and talks about the helper that is to come and basically breathing on them that spirit uh, to ultimately help them through. And I, I think that's a significant event that we sometimes maybe um, look over. Then we see Thomas, where he says, blessed are those who have not seen and believe. And then we see the reconciliation with Peter. And remember, we talked about that on uh, Wednesday. The, the nets don't tear. Uh, Peter is no longer uh, uh, what he says when he first meets Jesus, the sinner, but rather when he sees Jesus, uh, he's ready to go and to follow him. All right, so two things that, that I brought out. This is my conclusion. As, I, as I've tried to mention, focus is on who Jesus is and not just what he did. And then I think that uh, Sterling kind of mentioned this, but it begins with profound truths that, that he brings out the whole time and then it ends with a simple command. And what is that command? Well, I think it's that command to Peter. And this is a little bit of what we, I think we should try to pull out from this entire book is, the beginning says who Jesus is, and it profoundly talks about him. If you can read through those, the, ep- or the prologue there and actually dig deep into what he says about Jesus, it truly is profound. But then what he tries to do the entire book is to show us who Jesus is, and then ultimately we have a decision to make after that belief in him. We could choose to follow or choose not to. Um, I know we're done, but I have to finish with this. Please go to 1 John chapter 1, and we're just going to read the first four verses, and then uh, we'll conclude. It says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And when we, and we are writing these things to, excuse me, and we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. All right. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it. And uh, we'll have our transition service Wednesday night, and then the new classes will start next Sunday.